In this video, we're going to look at stress and strain in a beam. Let's say, for example, that we had a cantilevered beam as shown here, and we applied some force out on the end of the beam. And we wanted to know how the beam reacted to this force. That is, we wanted to know perhaps how much it deflected. We wanted to know what kind of stresses and what kind of strains were occurring at any particular point in the beam, or we wanted to know what was the reaction at the wall because of this force. Now to do this, we're going to look, we're going to use something called thin beam theory. And thin beam theory basically assumes that both the length of the beam, which we'll call L, and the width of the beam, which we'll call B, are much greater than the thickness of the beam which we will call H. So L is much greater than H and B is great, much greater than H. Now to solve the problem we have to know two things. First of all we have to know when we apply this force what kinds of forces and moments show up in the rest of the beam. And then secondly we have to know how do these forces and moments cause various strains in the beam. So first thing we do is we start with a two-dimensional uh, stylized version of this particular beam. And we'll draw it like this. And we'll say we'll apply some force F at some distance L from the wall. And we want to know, let's say, what's going on here. That is, we want to know what are the forces and the moments that must be created in order to uh, react against this force being applied at the end of the beam. So to do that, we cut our beam at position X, and we take what's left over, and we draw a free body diagram. Because the beam is statically loaded, that is, it's not moving, accelerating, or anything like that, we know that the sum of the forces have to be, uh, ha have to be the same. Because we're applying only one external force, F, the other forces have to, uh, uh, have to arise at the cut of the beam. That is, there's a, there's, a thin, there's a plane where we cut the beam where the internal forces in the beam are reacting against the external applied force, F. Now there's also a moment created in the beam because we have to be able to resist the the tendency for this beam to turn if we just applied these forces. And I've drawn the moment um, using a convention that we use, which is that on a leftward facing face, we draw the moment in the what would normally be considered the negative direction. I'm not going to go into big de details about the sign convention. We're mostly just interested in magnitudes of things in this particular video. But um, as the, as the problem gets more complicated, uh, you need to make sure that you figure out what the sign convention needs to be in order to make sure that you get the, the correct answer. Now it turns out for thin beams that the internal force created at the, at the plane where we cut the beam is, is negligible. That is, the, well the force isn't negligible, but the effect of the force is negligible compared to the effect of the moment at the cut beam. So if that's the case, we can solve for, all we need to do is solve for the moment at this cut face, and we can write uh, that by summing the, by knowing that for uh, static equilibrium, the sum of the moments has to be zero, and that's equal to minus m, as we've drawn it here, at minus f, the applied force, times the moment arm that that force is acting on, which is L minus X. If you remember your right hand rule, uh, when we're looking at a when we're looking at a coordinate system with the standard X and Y, a moment in the counterclockwise direction will have a positive value. And in this case, the moment at the internal face we've drawn as a negative value because of our sign convention and the force is acting downward, and so therefore we have a negative moment from that as well.
When we solve for the moment m, then we get m is equal to minus f times l minus x. So that means, for example, at x equals 0, that is, at the wall, the moment is equal to minus f times l minus x, but x is just 0 at that point. And so we get the moment is equal to minus f l. At x equals l, where we're actually applying the moment, we get the moment at l, sorry, let me put a 0 there, is equal to 0 because l minus x is equal to 0. And that makes sense because there's no moment at the point through which the force happens to be acting. Now, once we know the moment in the beam, now we can calculate the, the stresses and strains that are created internally to the beam or on the, on the surface of the beam as well. To do that, we look at a thin section of the beam, which I will draw like this. and we apply a moment to it. So our beam is of thickness h. We'll set our coordinate system such that y equals 0 goes through the middle of the, of the beam. That is, at the top, it's equal to y equals h over 2. And at the bottom, it's equal to y, it's y equals minus h over 2. And we'll apply a moment of strength m to one face. And in order to maintain equilibrium, we'll apply a moment of strength minus m to the other face. When we do this, we expect that the top part of the beam will compress, and the bottom part of the beam will expand, because we're pushing in on the top and we're pulling back on the bottom. And in fact, because of our thin beam, beam theory, we have two things that are going on. One is that a plane in our unloaded beam, so before we applied any force to our beam, that the, 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 the pieces of the beam that are in that plane will remain in that plane in the loaded beam. It's just that that loaded beam will, will deflect a little bit. The other thing is that there's something called the neutral axis, and the neutral axis is the point on the beam where there's no compression or, or extension. And for a beam that is symmetric, which we have in this case because we're assuming a rectangular beam, that, uh, that neutral axis goes through the middle of the beam at y equals 0. If that's the case, then we see that the change in x, so this little delta x at any, at any vertical position along this beam is proportional to y. And if that's the case, since, since the strain is just defined as the change in the length over the, the resting length, the beginning length, that means that the strain at any point y is proportional to y itself. And in this case, because the top part of the um, because the top part of the beam is compressing, that proportionality constant would be would be negative because we have uh, negative strain from compression and positive strain from extension down at the bottom. Now because we've created all of these strains in this beam, we've also created a bunch of stresses in this beam. And in fact, we can integrate all of those stresses, which are just forces acting over a given area, to figure out what the moment is, what moment is caused by all of these internal stresses, and that has to counter exactly the moment that's applied to the to the to the beam because of the force that we applied uh, at the at the end of it. So what we're going to do is we're going to divide up this beam into a bunch of thin sections, and I'm going to draw it a little bit thick, but a bunch of thin sections of height dy. And in each one of these, there's going to be some stress, which is a function of y. And that stress is acting against the moment 
that is uh, that is that has been applied to this particular um, this particular slice of the bean. So if that's the case, then the moment is going to be equal to negative the integral from minus h over two to h over two, and the negative is because these um, these stresses are acting against the the moment here. Each one of the, the the differential force that's applied at y, and that's just going to be equal to the stress over the area uh, times the area over which it acts, which in this case is is b, which is the the width of the beam, which we haven't drawn in the figure here, times dy, which is the differential height of the uh, area that the stress is acting over. And because a moment is a force times the moment arm over which it's acting, then we also multiply this by y, and we end up with an expression for the total moment created by all of the st internal stresses in this slice of the beam. But we said before that stress is proportional to E, which is the modulus of elasticity, times the strain. So we can write this as the integral from minus h over 2 to h over 2 times Young's modulus times the strain times b times y dy. So now, since we have assumed that the strain is proportional to y, the position above the neutral axis, we can write the strain is equal to some constant, and we'll call it alpha, times y. Knowing that doing this, that allows m equals minus the integral from minus h over 2 to h over 2 times e alpha b y squared dy. e alpha and b are just constants, so this ends up being uh, I'm going to put the alpha first, and then the b, and then the Young's modulus, times the integral of y squared, which is just y cubed over 3, evaluated from h over 2 to minus h over 2. And that's just going to be equal to alpha b e y cubed over 12. So now we can solve for alpha, and we see that alpha is equal to, let's see, m times 12 over b e y, I'm sorry, this is an h, not a y h cubed, my fault, h cubed. And I also forgot a minus sign, so we put a minus sign here and a minus sign out in front of this here. And because we said that the strain was equal to alpha y, that means that the strain at any point on our beam is equal to minus 12 times the moment over b e h cubed y. The strain is proportional to y. It's proportional to the, to the moment that you apply. Therefore, it's proportional to the force that you applied at the end of the beam. And it's inversely proportional to the width of the beam. That makes sense. The wider the beam is, the, the less the, the um, the less the beam is going to deform. It also has the modulus of elasticity in the denominator, which also makes sense. The stiffer the, the material is, the less it's going to deform. And h cubed as well. So the thicker the, the, the beam is, the less it will deform, but uh, the thickness of the beam acts as a, as, as a cubed. So it acts, it's a lot more important than the modulus of elasticity or the or the width, you can think of it that way. Now this equation holds only for a rectangular beam. 
but it turns out that it also holds more in general because we well we we can write this as if we go through the math with a non-rectangular beam we can show that the strain is equal to minus the moment times y over the modulus of elasticity times the moment of inertia, which we write as I. You can show that for a rectangular beam, the moment of inertia is given by B H cubed over 12. And if you substitute this into this equation here, you'll find that you get exactly the, the value for strain that we have above. So this is the general form of the equation, which holds for I-beams or any kind of thin beam, really, where you can calculate the moment of inertia. In our particular case, the example that we used, we used a rectangular beam, and so the moment of inertia is given by that uh, there. So now you can go from the force applied to our beam to calculating the moment at some point on the beam to calculating the strain at any position uh, at any position on the beam in the uh, in the in the in the y direction. So you could do it at the top surface, for example, if you were mounting a strain gauge, or you could find it at some internal point if you were really interested in knowing what the strain was at that internal point. 